Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the really green mountains and the rain. I even heard we got more rain than Seattle, God. I'm really happy about that. Jesus, thank you um, for giving us this beautiful space, for giving us air conditioning, for giving us um, friends. We want to announce that this space is your space. And we want to confess that some of us are here um, and we don't want to be here. But we're here. Some of us are afraid and anxious and trying to hang on to our sanity. Some of us are feeling really good and are really excited about what you're doing. We're all over the map, but we ask that you would honor that we're here. Holy Spirit, we ask that as the words are spoken and as we eat together and as we sing, that you would give us courage to believe what's true and to cast out what is false, that you would give us the grace um, to listen beneath the words of what people are saying and not always take them at face value, but really try to hear what you're saying to us. We ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So in the Gospel of John, it opens up in obviously chapter 1, and there's the scene where John the Baptist, who didn't write the Gospel of John, and and the Gospel of John's in the New Testament, um, but there's a scene with John the Baptist, who's a forerunner of Jesus, and John sees Jesus, and he points his disciples to Jesus. And I just want to read that scene for you. It starts in verse 35 of John 1. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus pass by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him, and it was about four in the afternoon. So there's this scene where two of John's disciples just start tagging along with Jesus, and Jesus turns around and he says, what do you want? Now, all of us are in this room, because we're in this room, have been at some level or some way pointed towards Jesus. And the question that's asked to you as someone who is either following Jesus or wrestling with following Jesus is a question from Jesus, which is the same one he gave these disciples. What do you want? And they asked, answered very wisely. They basically said, where are you going? Like, where are you staying? And he said something very interesting. He said, come and see. He didn't say, I'm on 35th Dust Street next to the camel, next to the donkey. He said, come and see. And as I've been contemplating life over the last few weeks, this idea has been kind of brewing in my mind that as you and I wake up in the morning and as we face life or as we stay up late in the evening, Really, the question that we need to ask Jesus is, where are you staying? But maybe a more modern question is, where are you going and what are you doing? Where are you? Because if you and I really believe that Jesus is life-transforming and that wherever Jesus is, there is the miraculous, then that's where you and I want to be. We don't want to be far away from the miraculous. We don't want to be far away from Jesus. So the question that we should ask ourselves is, where are you? What are you doing? How can I join you? Where are you staying? Now, I imagine when these disciples sat down with Jesus, Jesus began to talk to them and tell them a whole bunch of stuff. And I imagine that he probably sat down and told them a lot of what we've been learning over the last few weeks. You see, we're in this series, which I don't know where that clicker went. 
There we are. Oh, Zephaniah. We're in Zephaniah, but we're in this series that's, you know, called very creatively Zeph and Destruction. Because Zephaniah is all about destruction, right? It's about destruction. It's this minor prophet who wrote this prophecy, laid it out on paper, probably somewhere in 640 BC. It's three pages long, three chapters long. And most of it is about the consequences that you and I experience when we disobey and we continue to disobey and we continue to walk away. Now, it's particularly spoken to these Israelites in the southern kingdom. So that's all that's left is Judah and Jerusalem. And it's written to them because Israel's already gone. The rest of the tribes are gone into captivity. And there's this young king named Josiah, and he's trying to reform the people, but the people are so far gone, and the rulers are so far gone. So Zephaniah comes along, and he says, let me try to help. And he writes a, quite a book. Now, in this book of constant consequence and constant destruction, there are some points that I think Jesus probably began to tell these disciples, same ideas that these disciples may have heard over the table with Jesus. The first thing in chapter 1 was this whole list of destruction. But in the middle of this destruction, every commentator I read says that in verse 7, basically God says, shh, be quiet. Because you can feel as you read chapter 1 that it's rising in you to say, wait, 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 no, not me, not me. Wait, no, no, not us. We're not doing that. And really the invitation of chapter 1 is just to be quiet and to feel the weight of the consequences of the community sin and your own sin. To just feel it. Which is something that we probably don't take a lot of time to do. Right? The second chapter emphasizes, in the midst of all of the destruction, that the key to deliverance is for us as a community to gather and seek God. To gather and seek humility and to gather and seek righteousness. And we're supposed to seek all of that in the Lord, who's the one who's punishing us. That the deliverance is if we gather and seek protection from God by seeking righteousness and humility. So there's this, be quiet, get together and seek hum- uh, righteousness and humility. And then we broke chapter 3 into three parts. And I suspect Jesus was explaining these things over the table at the beginning of all of this to these disciples, same ideas. But Jesus says, or God says in chapter 3, first part of Zephaniah, that even though you've gone off and done your thing, I haven't left the city. I'm still here. I haven't abandoned you. I haven't gone anywhere. All you need to do is reach out and get me. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I haven't abandoned you. So it's be quiet, seek and gather. I haven't left you. And then last week, Mark Talk to us about how God, Zephaniah, God says to Zephaniah, okay, I haven't abandoned you, but you're going to need me to purify you. And so he says, I'm going to purify your lips and I'm going to give you a, a, I'm going to bring you together and give you a common language. And and I don't have time to explain this, but my wife will tell me, like, get mad at me. So this is, this is for my wife. For those of you like geeky things, Zephaniah verse 9 to I think verse 13 is a complete reconstruction of the Tower of Babel. It's done in the language. It's done on purpose. God uses Zephaniah to say, in this little section, what I'm going to do is take all the consequences of the Tower of Babel, the separation, the breaking of community, the consequences of you being selfish, and I'm going to reconstruct you as a community. I'm going to build you back up. And what Mark suggested to us is in response to that, we need to serve one another and take courage. That that's the response to being purified by God, having our lips purified, is that we need to serve and we need to take courage. So so as I imagine what Jesus might have told those disciples over the table, I know he didn't probably talk about Zephaniah, but these principles are discipleship principles. These are things that we all need to know that there's a sense of us needing to be quiet, a sense of gathering, a knowing that God hasn't abandoned us, and a knowing that God's action in our life is purifying. 
But I think that Jesus offered these disciples one more thing that Zephaniah offers. And that is this invitation to sing a song. So we're going to pick up our story in Zephaniah in chapter 3, starting in verse 14. It says, Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. I think you need to understand when you hear a command to Israel and you're the church, is that yes, these words are to Israel, but they are words to us as the church too. And there's this moment in Zephaniah after all this destruction that there's this restoration happening and the call is to sing, to shout. And this is not to sing melancholy songs. This is not summer where you're Twitter painted by a girl and you're singing a happy song. These are victorious songs. These are songs with energy and maybe even a little bit of anger over all the destruction. These are songs that says God has been victorious. That's the kind of sense here. It's a yelling. It's a community thing. Yes, it's an individual thing that you need to sing, but it's us together making a pronouncement. Now, singing is important because all of us, at some level or another, like music. Some of us define our life by music. Right? We've got a song for every event. We've got a song for when we go to the bathroom, a song for when we go to bed, a song for when we fell in love, and we, our whole life is built on lyrics. Some of us don't ever even remember any of the lyrics. We just love the music. We love the way that song sounds. We don't even know who the artists are we like. People are like, who do you like? I don't know. I like that sound. It's kind of this and that. And, and we don't even know what subcategory we belong to. right? But the thing about music is that it bypasses your defenses. And music and singing with other people and listening to music, it, it touches your heart. Now, here's an interesting thing, and you can go fact check me if you want, but this is true because I heard it on NPR, and they say they're reliable, all right? But what happens sometimes when people have a heart transplant is that they adopt the tastes and music of the person who gave them the heart. And what they've discovered is that we store some memories in particular music and taste, in our heart. Kind of crazy. And so music does something literally to our organ, the heart. It, it changes us. And, and I don't know if you've ever noticed that like, when you're not depressed and you hear a mournful song, all of a sudden you have these depressed feelings just come from out of nowhere. Or if you want to just be happy and clean the house, you have to turn on system of a down because you need to like move up and down and vacuum with anger, right? <laughs> to change your heart so that you could actually want to clean. Right? So there's, there's that music changes us. So we have to be careful what we sing. We do need to be careful of what we sing and what we listen to. Um, but there's this call to sing because it changes us. Now, Zephaniah is going to give us the song that we're called to sing. And I would argue to you, and I know I'm, I'm putting conjecture here, but I would argue to you that as those two disciples sat with Jesus, that he began to teach them a song. He began to teach them a song, and it was a song very similar to the song that Zephaniah is going to offer us. So let me read the reason that you should, and I should sing, and really what we are singing starting in verse 15. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. There are four elements to this song that I think you and I are called to sing. The first element is forgiveness. It says, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. 
the song that Jesus invites us to sing, the song that God is inviting Israel to sing, is a song of forgiveness. It's a song that says, the punishment that you deserved is gone. But you know what? You and I, singing about forgiveness is difficult because we don't like to forgive. And on top of that, we don't like being forgiven. These two things make us feel really weird inside right? There's this like, you feel squishy inside, and when you have to forgive, sometimes you feel angry. But here's the reason that you would sing it. It kind of works this way, and I'm glad my mom's not here, because I think the story is more legend than reality. Um, but I'm pretty sure, like, well, I know this part is true, that when, before I would go, my brothers and I would go have dinner at somebody's house. She would always prep us, because guess what? If you didn't know this, Little kids are picky, right? They, they're picky. So you gotta, you gotta prep them for when they go eat at somebody's home. Because if you don't prep them, then you shouldn't discipline them. You should just let them be. You gotta prep them when they go sit at the table that, hey, you're gonna have to eat what served you. But my mother had extended this. We were to compliment the chef, the, the, whoever cooked, tell them how good it was, and give them one thing we really liked about it and ask them for seconds if there were seconds, even if we didn't like it. Now, that's pretty intense, and I think it may be somewhat legendary. But another thing that my mother did, and I, uh, it was very helpful, is that she often would have us practice talking about, you know, when we were being negative, she would make us practice talking about the positive things, like we didn't want to go to school. Well, what are two things you like about school? Right? We, we had to work, because what happens is that when we sing, when we talk, when we say this is, when we speak about truth, even if we don't like truth, it begins to penetrate our heart. And so the first and most important part of the song that God is inviting us to sing and Jesus is inviting us to sing is a song of forgiveness. It's a song that we're forgiven and that we are to forgive. That our enemy has been turned back. Our punishment has been held back. The first verse is about forgiveness. The second verse, it says, The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The second verse that we're called to sing is a freedom from fear. It's this very idea that God has not abandoned us in the midst of things. Now here's the thing. When, when we're called to sing, I am not afraid, it does not mean that we don't feel afraid. Because that's never worked for me. I feel afraid a lot. I live my life afraid. But I am not afraid. You know why I'm not afraid? It's because Jesus is with me. It's because it's the thing that I hold on to and sing because God has delivered me and is with me and he calls me to hold my hands up. Right? So the second verse of the song that we're invited to sing is a song about being free from sin. I mean, free from fear. So forgiveness and a freedom from fear because of the presence of God with us and the second, our third line, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. I don't know if you think this, but I do. I'm pretty sure I need to be saved. There is a lot that I need saving from. I was in the shower today thinking about this. And I'm like, you know, I need saving, yes, from the basic things of, of I am a sinful person who's judged and needs Jesus, but I just need saving from my own habitual, like, obsessive thinking. So I sit in the shower and I think, why is the drain not draining? And then I begin to process that and lose myself in the shower, right? Like, I just need to be saved from myself. And so it's very reassuring to me that what I'm invited to sing is that I am saved. And you know what I'm saved by? A mighty warrior. Now, this is a weird confession for your pastor, but I don't play video games very much, but when I can play them with my kids, I'll do that. And I have an Xbox, and my dad's here. I have an Xbox, Dad. Sorry. Uh, 
I'm going to confess. I'm forgiven. But anyway, in all of that, there's this game called Diablo. (laughs) Wow, here we go. Confessions are coming. But here's the thing. I got to play this gigantic guy. It was bigger than everybody else. Bigger than Rod. And, and it was, it was, you know, and, and my son was like, wow, you're just like hacking everybody and nobody hurts you. And my wife was like, why doesn't anybody ever die? And I'm like, it's because of me. Like, I'm a mighty warrior. But you know, okay, it's a video game and it's little pixels, but, but it gives me a sense of who God is. That as we're going through this, as we're wrestling, the song we're singing is, this mighty warrior out in front of us has saved me. I'm saved. He's here. Right? Yeah. It's a song. It's a thing that we're to sing together. It's a pronouncement of what is true. We are forgiven. We are without fear. And we are saved. And the fourth line, it says, He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you. The fourth verse is all about love. God loves you. He delights in you. I was talking to Corey yesterday, and we were talking about his birthday. And I said, well, what did your daughter get you? And his daughter's really tiny. He said, well, my daughter gave me a card with her hand printed on it, which was probably mostly mom's doing. But he pinned that somewhere in his office. And I was reflecting on the first pieces of art that my children gave me. And you put them on the refrigerator. And, and there's this weird like pride you have in this bad art. Like, like you just are like, this is the best. My daughter is going to be world famous and she loves me. Like there's this delight that's uncontrollable and just kind of spews out of you, right? Well, that's what God does over you. Your pictures, what he's saying is, I put your pictures on the refrigerator. What you're singing is God has my pictures on his refrigerator. Like he loves me. And he's removed his rebuke. So I, I imagine that, that Jesus offered this beginning song. The song of Zephaniah to these disciples. But the cool thing about Zephaniah is that he doesn't just tell us what we're to sing. He kind of lets us in on what God is singing with us. Now I don't know how many of you were here a year or two ago when my wife sneakily trained the band to sing a song that she'd written about me a long time ago and then at the end of service they were like oh wait there's one more thing and all of you got to sit and watch her sing this beautiful song to me that i love and you got to watch me cry and you you got to watch her sing over me and when I talk about that and when I think about that and I imagine all of you there and I imagine her, like I, I start, I can feel like, the, like I might cry if I don't hold it together. And because it has a power over me. It's the power of love and it's the power of love being sung over me and having you be part of it. Well, that is only a small little taste of what God is doing as we sing I am loved and I am saved and I am free from fear and I am forgiven. We are all these things. God sings alongside us. And it says in the second half of, well, I'll just read all of verse 17. But he says, he will take great delight in you in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And I don't know if these next verses are god's song but it sure sounds like it and this is what he says i will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals which is a burden and a reproach for you you probably thought what the heck is he talking about the niv does a very bad job go read the nasb and it'll make a lot more sense but let me just quickly tell you what it means it means that he's saying all of you who are in foreign lands who can't follow god in the way you want and celebrate the way you want and it's and and people are making fun of you and and pushing in on you i'm going to bring you home i'm going to take you out of that right verse 19 he says at that time i will deal with all who oppressed you i will rescue 
the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise. Among all peoples of the earth will I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Now, I would suggest to you that you go home and you read this in a whole bunch of different translations. And you let it just kind of soak in what God is singing over you. I'm not going to break it all down. I just want you to hear two things. Number one, that God says, I am going to bring you home. That this song is a song of hope and a song of the future. So as we sing, we as a people are loved and forgiven and saved and not afraid. God is singing, and I will bring you home and I will lift you up and I will bring you home and I will lift you up and I will restore you. The song that God sings over us is a song of hope. And the song that we're given to sing about God and what he has done in our life is a song of hope. And I think that all of life is basically one of two songs. And I think that Jesus, when he was sitting with those disciples, probably laid it out and said, you have two choices. You can come follow me and sing a song of hope and of grace and have that sung over you, or you can sing a song of bitterness and resentment. Right? A song of bitterness and resentment. Now, I think that all of us, from the moment we get up in the morning, face these things. We face it in our spouses, in our children, in our workmates, in ourselves, this opportunity to sing a song of ambivalence and bitterness and anger and ang- anguish or a song of grace and a song of hope. Right? We have this choice over and over again. Now, I know actually, though, that this is not easy. Let me flip the slide there. I should have read that. And so I don't do a lot of movie clips, but I do, when I'm going to do one, it's going to be The Matrix. Okay, you all know this because I've been around, I think I've used like two other movies. Yeah, Star Wars or The Matrix. Okay, so we may have some te- technical difficulties with this, but let me prep the, the clip for you. For those of you who haven't seen The Matrix, it's about this guy named Neo. And the scene that we're going to look at is he's been pursued by some people, and they're going to give him a choice. And that choice... Um, is to either go into this really unknown reality or to go back to where he was and forget everything. Um, so go ahead and we'll see if this actually works. We're streaming live from YouTube. Hey, get in. It's necessary, Neo. For our protection. From what? From you. Take off your shirt. What? Stop the car. Listen to me, Copper Top. We don't have time for 20 questions. Right now, there's only one rule our way or the highway. Please, Neo, you have to trust me. Why? Because you have been down there, Neo. You know that road. You know exactly where it ends. And I know that's not where you want to be. You could pause it. Yeah, we might want to pause that before that. Uh, uh, quick, slip to the other thing. Get out, get out. <laughs> you'll have to watch the movie. Now, you'll notice a few things about that film. One is that it's dingy, right? It's the, the filmmaker has chosen, for a lot of reasons, to this world to be dark and damp and green 
And, and it's to represent some of the oppression that we feel as people living in this world. Now, why I love this is that I feel like over and over again, I'm in the backseat of that car. I am Neo. I am faced with this decision to step into singing a song of grace, hope, forgiveness, having God sing over me, all this vulnerability, all those kinds of things that seem very unknown, and I'm not quite sure they work. And I'm pretty into things working. But I'm pretty... But but that door opening is one of the most powerful scenes. She says, you know, you, you've been down that road. I've been down the road of anger and resentment and fear. It's a terrifying road. But it's the decision that we have. We have it all the time. It's not just once to choose Jesus or not. It's the way we're going to interact with people, the way we're going to care, the way we're going to love, the way we're going to deal with life. But I understand that it's difficult. And I think that's the invitation that we have is to sing this song. Now, as I said, it's not easy, but I I would like to say that the song actually begins, the invitation doesn't begin in chapter 1 of John. It's just, I think Jesus told these two disciples, here's the song. This is what it's going to be like. The song actually begins at the foot of the cross. And Jesus is on the cross. And in that scene with Jesus on the cross, he looks down in the Gospel of John, tells us that he looks down at his mom, who's looking at the tortured body of her son. And he looks at the disciple John and he says, John, she's now yours. She's your mom. That all of the Gospel accounts tell us of how he was mocked and told to come down. But Matthew lets us in on the first chord of the Song of Hope. And it's minor, not major. Let me read it to you. In Matthew 27, I believe, verse 45, it says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why Have you forsaken me? At the moment when God is going to offer us the song of forgiveness, Jesus asked this question, why am I all alone? Why am I all alone? Why have you abandoned me? It's in a a small way, sitting in the backseat of that car in that movie, it's just a little taste of, of that minor chord. We all feel it. Every moment that we're invited into singing the song of grace and hope, there is this minor chord of abandonment and of loneliness uh, because it starts at the cross. It starts at that moment. But you know what? A few verses later, Jesus, he forgives them and he says, it's finished. And he dies. And he begins, we get this opportunity to sing the song. And yes, he raises from the dead and, and, and the song becomes a powerful song of light. But tonight, we've finished Zephaniah. And what I want you to get a taste of is that even though there's all of this judgment and all of this you know, consequence for our sin, Zephaniah still has hope And Zephaniah actually gives us this beautiful song to sing that is actually Jesus' song. And he gives us a picture of what Jesus sings to us. Now here's why that's important. And here's why I think it changes us. It's because internally, no matter where you are in life, and we're all in different places, but internally, you are all pretty fickle. And one day you feel really good about yourself. And the next day, you say something stupid and someone frowns at you and then all of the shame of your life and everything and your mother's face shows up and it's a nightmare. And you thought you were doing good. Right? Right? If you allow those things to be the thing that defines you, then you're singing a song of darkness. If you are in a place where you're going to internally sing the song of your emotional well-being. It's fickle, 
and it's going to be dark most of the time. And who you are is going to be very difficult to understand. And you're not going to be a very kind person. And you're not going to follow Jesus. And you're not going to be around the miraculous. But if you're willing to sing, what singing is, is you saying, you know what? I'm going to let someone who isn't fickle define who I am. I'm going to allow the God of the universe who doesn't need anyone to tell him who he is, tell me who I am. Because the only way that we can know who we are is by being told by the God of the universe who we are. And so my invitation to you tonight is to begin to sing the song of forgiveness. To sing the song of freedom from fear and salvation and love. And I want you to hear the chorus in the back of your head of God saying, I will bring you home. But don't forget that it isn't just easy. It starts with a minor chord. And then it bursts into the major. It shifts keys. So I think that's what Zephaniah is inviting us into. Tonight we're not going to have a lot of time to respond to me. Um, So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time praying. Then we're going to take communion and sing together and eat. And you can kind of continue this conversation. So let's pray. Father, again, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your grace. Thank you for the hope that you will bring us home and you will restore us. And I ask that you would bless the food and that you would bless our time together as we sing. I ask that in your holy name. Amen.